After decades of rising debt, dwindling population, and increased racial tensions, the birthplace of Motown and the American auto industry is mounting a comeback. $19 billion in debt, unemployment rate of about 14%, about a third of the population has moved out over the last several decades. It's great to see these stories about Detroit making a yes, comeback. And if you spend city. any time there, people are so invested in making it happen. Yeah. You have some gentrifying going on. You yeah. have people who have been in the community for years. They're being being pushed out. The new Detroit is only the new Detroit because the old Detroit is the foundation. Downtown is happening, so is Midtown. I mean, you literally can't even find a place or an apartment here. We want to live here and we want to do what we've been doing all of our lives. We're struggling and everybody are. Everybody is. Everybody's struggling here. Been here all my life. I've seen the good and I'm seeing the bad. Now hopefully I'll see the good again. Thank, Thank you, Dan, for what you're doing for Detroit. Why should Detroit be saved of all the cities? Detroit doesn't need to be saved. Detroit is flourishing. about to witness the very exciting story of a city and its people. It will be an adventure that will open new sights in familiar surroundings. It is a story of a city seeking new horizons in a resolute contest with great challenges. That city is Detroit. Yes, Detroit is enjoying its finest hour. There is a renaissance, a, a rebirth in the city. There's a newness in Detroit. Whenever you hear about Detroit, you hear about two extremes. You hear that it's an abandoned city and it's an up and coming city, which are both true in some regard, but it seems like, a, like an oversimplified version of what's really happening here. I think there's a lot of gray area in the middle and I want to explore that. I want to know what everyday Detroiters think about what's going on in their city and what their city is to them. My first stop is a place where many of those everyday Detroiters used to work, the Packard Auto Plant. Getting a good dose of post-apocalyptic lifestyle right now. Walking through what is now the world's largest abandoned factory, I felt like I was in a bombed out, forgotten city. And the Packard plant really was its own city. This massive three and a half million square foot complex once employed 36,000 people. When the factory opened in 1903, workers flocked here from all over the country for their shot at the American dream. Hundreds of thousands of cars were assembled here before the plant closed in 1958. What remains today is just a ghost of that great city within a city. So this hallway was the production line where they would build the cars. They would start on that end and put all the parts on the cars until it got to that end and then it would be a finished product. I'm gonna say that this hallway is like three blocks long. All I had to do was take a left turn and stand in this light, and then boom, epic ruin porn. It's way easier to point a camera at something and say this is a problem than it is to actually fix it. I think there's a lot of people 
pointing at things and saying that's a problem and not a lot of people trying to fix them. I think this place in particular has a very large wow factor. So you get a lot of people coming here and photographing it and saying, this is Detroit. I feel a little nervous that we're adding to the ruin porn pile. I'm gonna try not to. I don't wanna just show a one dimensional story about Detroit. It's really easy for us to come here and just fly our drone through this place and say, we got a story. But you gotta think that when you come to these places that people actually live there, they grew up there, they're gonna raise families there. And you can't just go there and look at their pile of garbage and say that's how they are. This place is so infamous that hundreds of people come here every day to shoot photos and to tour through the place, which eventually became a security problem because people were getting robbed for their cameras. Now there's 24 seven security. Like we even have a security guard watching our cars today. Majority of the people that come to here is mostly people that stay outside of Detroit. Okay. More suburban people, mm -hmm. you know, very small number of locals. It's a, it's a destination. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like this is Detroit's version of the Coliseum. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a spectacle. What's this neighborhood like now? Deserted, a lot of vacant and uh, abandoned houses. I grew up in this neighborhood, so I seen the good and the bad. Right. Detroit is on a climb, you know. It's on a climb? I believe so. Yeah. I believe Detroit is on a climb now. Majority of this city is caring, you know. I care. And they don't report that a lot about people caring about right. the city. All they hear about is the negativity right. of the city. So, Rob's right. It's easy to focus on negativity and point fingers when someone or somewhere is on the way down. But the Packard plant may be on its way back up. In 2014, a developer bought it for $405,000 with the intent of converting it to a mix of housing, retail, and public space. If all goes according to plan, this great structure will live again. It's a growing trend in this city. Abandoned property and vacant land being cleaned up and repurposed. We were just driving down the street and we saw this cleanup operation going on. We figured we'd pull over and see what's happening. This is a cleanup operation with Recovery Park Farms. Okay. Uh, and the idea is to be able to like take advantage of all the vacant lots in Detroit and be able to start growing on those vacant lots and servicing the product right here at this historical market, uh, Shane Ferry Market. That's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. I hear one of two stories with Detroit. I yeah. either hear it's an abandoned lost city or it's an up and coming city. It's true. Both it's of true. them? Both, <laughs> both, both are true. Yeah. And I think this is one of the innovative ways that Detroit is quote unquote coming back. Brent told me that after the local Chrysler plant was shut down and relocated, this once vibrant neighborhood went downhill fast. Just like Flint, Michigan, just like Gary, Indiana, and other cities that have large populations of people of color and poor whites working, mm -hmm. um, that plant left. Okay. Uh, and this is the aftermath of the plants leaving. You also had people making money off of burning down houses for house insurance. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and people, you know, were paying guys, you know, to burn down to burn, to burn down properties. If you're somebody that you know uh, has been denied job offers, and somebody tells you, "Hey, throw this Molotov cocktail on this house, I'll throw you five hundred dollars," like, hey, that's that's, that's business. Yeah. I think Detroit is a city that's got spirit and it's got heart and it's got like the resilience to be a city again if people are willing to want to communicate, learn about the history of Detroit, learn about how segregation has kind of like destroyed the city in the past. Right. People talk about what happened in like the 80s and the 90s, but like literally in the last five, 10 years, some of these houses were burned down. Yeah. And and so, yeah, Motor City Grounds Crew, Recovery Park, we want to provide jobs yep. for returning citizens, yep. for community members in the neighborhood to where, you know, you're really, like, balancing the city again. Well, I think you're doing great work, man. Thank you, man. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. It was great to talk with Brent. He seems like he's doing a lot for the community. They're cleaning up this lot, and eventually it's going to be an urban farm, and then all the fruit and vegetables is going to be sold across the street in this old market 
And right now we're currently in a food desert. So that means there's nowhere to get fresh food around here. People buy their groceries at a corner store. So it's something the community really needs. Detroit. It's become known as the poster child of abandonment in the United States. But an effort to change that label is underway, thanks to local companies like Detroit Dirt. Passion Murray started the company five years ago with the mission to rebuild a greener city from the ground up, one compost pile at a time. So the Detroit Zoo, they come in and they bring about 20 yards. Zoo manure. Zoo manure, the rhinos, the giraffes, the good stuff. <laughs> this is that's giraffe a, shit? That's, this is giraffe shit, yeah. Thank God for the zoo, because they got the good shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Can I eat it? Go ahead. <laughs> that's food recovery. <laughs> uh, I'll recover some celery. <laughs> And that's why we need to be recovering food. You all are crazy somebody. for throwing this away. <laughs> Passion has transformed this vacant plot of land into a place where recovered food waste and rhino turds combine to produce fertile soil for Detroit's urban farms. So what would you say your, your goal is with this project? My goal, I've actually, actually reached my goal, which was to get the city to pay attention to the progress. So now the city can look at this as a scalable model. This can be replicated anywhere in the country. It's a movement that will turn into our culture. Mm -hmm. So if I can get people in New York, and Miami, and DC, and LA, all joining together to push you know, the purpose of this, mm -hmm. and our whole country is gonna start doing it. Compost or die. Compost or die. <laughs> Passion asked me to help her take some of that good Detroit dirt to one of the urban farms she supplies. He's gonna be my new partner now. <laughs> Since she started trucking compost around town, Passion has seen a lot of changes in the Detroit landscape. It's interesting how the city has evolved over the last like five years because you see cranes in the air now. And yep. So the revitalization of the city is definitely real and true. Yeah. And I'm excited because I've just kind of watched it evolve over a 10 year time frame. So. Are there a lot of urban farms in Detroit? Oh God, yeah. Like tons. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say about five years ago, really a lot of them popped up and farms like Oakland Avenue rely on passion to deliver the best smelling shit in town. Oh, it looks good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mustard greens, turnips, collards, it's looking good. In this community, people were buying food at the gas station, the liquor store, you know the, yeah. you know the script. Food desert. The food desert, yeah. And so we wanted to encourage folks, come on in and feed your family. And make a healthier community. Right. Yeah. What do you think the future of this neighborhood is going to be? Well, it's already happening. What we are afraid of is gentrification. OK. You see things posted on Facebook like, why pay $1,500 in Ann Arbor when you can pay $900 in the North End? Well, people in the North End who live here, mm -hmm. $900 is a lot of money. Yeah. Rent. Yeah. That's, that's a problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a big problem for the city across the board, mm -hmm. gentrification, yeah. 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 We have two Detroits. Okay. We have the downtown Detroit, and then you have the real Detroit, and that's the neighborhood. When I go downtown, I don't even know it. You know, it's like, where are the black folks at? <laughs> you know? And then, um, <laughs> I mean, seriously. <laughs> no, she's telling the truth. I've lived down there for over yeah. 10 years. So. Yeah. Right. And that's a big change. It is a drastic change. This is change. my first time here. So it is a drastic yeah. change. But in the neighborhood, it's completely different in terms of the revitalization. We're like, OK, when they going to come and uh, fix these potholes? When they're going to come and give us some decent sidewalks? Put some lights in the street. And put some lights. Nationally, the focus is on downtown and midtown and, and Corktown. Mm -hmm. But to her point, the neighborhoods that anchor all these mm -hmm. places, it needs to spread out mm -hmm. through all those mm -hmm. neighborhoods. 
to push people out who have lived their whole lives here, who have had businesses here, the ones who did stay. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. No. It's not yeah. fair at all. And um, some of the people who destroyed it, they want to come in and tell people how to fix it. Right. And one way these newcomers try to quote unquote fix these neighborhoods is by attempting to rename them. I met up with Cornetta Lane, who fought back against gentrification and stood up for her community. My neighborhood, Cork City, was in danger of being rebranded as West Corktown. If you put Corktown in the name of a neighborhood, uh, it is perceived to be safe, okay. uh, trendy, mm -hmm. um, and up and coming. I was like scrolling through my Facebook newsfeed, yeah. and I come across an article um, that reads, West Corktown, creating Detroit's newest neighborhood. They developed a logo and then a website and then a Facebook page of 1,200 likes, Whoa. and then T-shirts. <laughs> so they were they were branding. So they were branding Core City as something that it wasn't. Correct. Yeah. Correct. The the type of folks that has come out of have come out of Core City, uh, you know, you got Rosa Parks herself. All right. Uh, you got Stevie Wonder. Those are some really heavy hitters. Yeah, heavy hitters, right? Yeah. So I just I I really did. Um, I think the people of Core City is what makes. Core City. Cornetta put a stop to the rebranding, for now. And in an effort to further knit her community together, she started a neighborhood bike tour called Core City Stories. Was Core City always a struggling area? It had its like glorious days and also its dark days. Okay. Um, and I feel right now we're on a rebound. People who uh, live in this area, first of all, they're resilient. Um, and second of all, they are committed to, to seeing um, you know, better days in Core City. It's of my opinion that the people in Detroit don't want Detroit to look like that. Of course, <laughs> of course. And it's not that their fault. Yeah. And it takes more than just the people that live in the neighborhood to do it, you know, it's like you need, you need bigger resources. To knock that place down, you need machinery. Yeah, for sure. We're in North Corktown right now, and Cornetta wants to introduce me to Mr. King the unofficial mayor of North Corktown. I heard you're the unofficial mayor of this area. Yeah, I, I, I believe I am, yeah. though, because, like I said, I helps all the, the neighbors out, you know, the seniors, the ones they cannot afford they snow, I, I do they snow. Right. I feel good about that. Yeah. My mother taught me, you come in this world with nothing, you leave this world with nothing, but only a kind word to be said. Now, this is what we be doing. We pass our produce. Got my bell peppers, got fresh eggs, other little whatnot, nice. potatoes, and we service the community and anyone we can. This used to be the most beautiful neighborhood. Garages, houses, kids playing, running up and down the street, playing high and go see. Got guys standing on the corner. And we used to call that crooning, standing on the corner, singing Temptations yeah. and, and all that, you know. Yeah. But all that is gone now. So, you know, we trying to bring it back. Have you heard that uh, some people wanted to change the name of the area here? Yeah, I heard that. I heard it from a few of the uh, residents. This is history, so that's why they should leave it. You know, don't change the name. Mm -hmm. When you change the name, what name do you want it to be? Right. That's another form of control. Mm -hmm. See, let it go. Yeah. Let's live. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. Hey, thank you, and I appreciate y'all yeah. appreciate me. <laughs> <laughs> if Detroit had a zodiac sign, what would it be? Oh, uh, that's so good. It would probably be a Capricorn, because Capricorns work hard. OK. And Detroit, we're working hard to be the best city that we can. And few are working harder for their city than Cornetta. She doesn't just live in this neighborhood, she lives for it. And in a rapidly evolving landscape like Detroit, if you don't stand up for your neighborhood, you could lose it. We're back home, yay! What do you think when you hear people say that, uh, you know, Detroit's sort of a blank slate and they can come here and do whatever they want? So unfortunately, um, people that are outside of Detroit, they hear news from people who just moved to Detroit saying, 
Oh, like you can do anything you want, like a land of opportunity. Um, and while there are tons of opportunities to take advantage of here, Detroit is not a blank slate. Detroit rather is a canvas that is missing pieces to it. And if you could find yourself in Detroit, you know, painting along those edges and, and, and um, kind of like being a piece of the puzzle and not trying to like create a whole new puzzle, um, you know, that's, that's the type of residence that Detroit needs. Yes, ready? While many see Detroit's crumbling buildings as eyesores, there are those who recognize them as creative opportunities. This is creepy. Yeah. Look out for holes in the ground. There's a lot of them. I'm here with my friend Justin, who's a local Detroit skater. And uh, what he does is he goes into some of these buildings and builds some skate spots in them sometimes. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. When did you first come in here? Uh, first time I came in here was about six years ago. It's changed a lot since that time. These buildings are constantly changing, evolving from just being exposed to the weather, especially scrappers. You can see that the roof here, like the ceiling is fire damaged. And uh, yes, there's been a lot of fires and just things that are torn down. You made this more skatable or? Yeah, actually we ended up pouring over 2,000 pounds of cement on this. <laughs> I had to get new shocks on my car after doing this project because huh. all the cement that I hauled oh, yeah. in my car to uh, bring it here. It was a pretty time consuming <laughs> and like back breaking process and it's still such a hard thing to skate, yeah. but it's skatable now and it's cool. It's a, if you're able to do something on it, it's, yeah. it's pretty sweet. Oh, it's gone. Hi. <laughs> hey, friend. You know what sucks is rough right here. Watch your head. We're up on the roof, walking around on a very weak wooden floor. And uh, looks like there's another skate spot up here. It's looking pretty weathered. I don't know if it survived the winter. We've probably done work and built stuff in about 10 different buildings around the city. And I feel like we're able to like, you know, do a little creative reuse. Like it's these forgotten things that no one cares about and now we're making something useful out of them, kind of bringing them back to life in a way. You just have a lot of freedom to do what you like, and that's a big part of skateboarding is creativity and just imagining what if, what can you do here, what's possible, and if you're willing to put in the time and the effort and the work, which is a lot of times just super dirty and grueling, like, you can make it happen. It's really just up to you. These buildings give a lot of possibility that might not be a possibility outside in the streets where things we build will get demolished pretty fast. Here they have some kind of lifespan, but it's a, uh, you know, that lifespan is always unknown. It's really up to the elements, up to the scrappers and the others that wander the building, how long our stuff lasts. I think it's cool that hard work is still being done in this building, years after it was closed, and in their own small way. Justin and his friends are contributing to Detroit's revitalization. Over in Midtown, they wanted to show me another DIY park they helped build at an abandoned rec center. Welcome to the wig. They say I waste my days no matter what I do. No matter what I do, they say I waste my days. Look 
So how long has this been going on for? Uh, about a year and a half now. Okay. Since we uh, took over. That's how the city's coming back right now is, you know, the youth and the people that care yeah. stepping up and saying, you know, you know, I'm taking, you know, I'm taking this, and people are finding avenues to do it. They're finding funding to do it. There's a lot of people that you know want to help the city grow, and you know they're finding the right avenues to do that. And it's like here for the taking. You know, right. The city's like reshaping itself. In a place that's so rapidly changing, lofts and condos are popping up all over Midtown, and the city is currently seeking developers to turn the Wig into a massive residential project. This would come as a huge loss for locals like Wesley Smith. I used to live like right there on the street years ago, like before this was even here. It was just a bunch of like drug dealers and like, you know, football players and stuff. This is like the only freedom that we have here. You know, there's nothing else. This is the only freedom that we have. It's like a drug, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you, you never want to stop. <laughs> you know, you never want to stop. Like I've noticed, like I, I, I never, I can't go along without skating. So that shit's like pretty much saved my life. Living in the city, like, they don't have anything for us here. You know, they usually take away stuff before they give more stuff. The real Detroit is this, you know what I'm saying? This is real Detroit. They want us to say we're scary. They want us to say that, you know, we're juvenile or something like that. They want to say that, but I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say what's really going on. We're struggling. Everybody is. Everybody's struggling here. That whole advertisement in New York, go to Detroit, go to Detroit. All right, cool, you can come to Detroit. It's no problem. But. Don't ignore the people that was here. Detroit gets worldwide press for its struggle with abandonment but it also has a reputation for crime and violence. And these two issues are unmistakably linked. Without a strong working population, the tax base erodes, which leaves huge funding gaps for city services like policing. And increasingly, these gaps are being filled by private security firms. This is the Detroit Threat Management Center, home of the Vipers. I'm here to meet their founder, Commander Dale Brown. So we're gonna get a tour of the yeah, come threat on management in. center? Come on in. Whoa. This is the Threat Management Center, Tactical Training Center. What we do here is teach people how to overcome fear. Therefore, they're able to manage threats properly. To get rid of the fear, we have to you know, train you to overcome that, just that natural feeling of fear, and get used to uh, responding and functioning under fear-based conditions. Right. This is what we call quad bags. Boxers, they box one person. Yeah. Uh, and in real life, unfortunately, especially here in America, people like to fight four on one or more on one. Okay. And in order for you to prepare for that, we have what's called the quad bags. They're connected here at the top. Okay. So when you hit one, the other one's coming from the uh, rear. Oh, okay. So you're learning how to pay attention in all directions right. and defend yourself. You think I can do it? You can do it. You can just start off just pushing them off you. Just push them off. Get away. Push. And remember they're Ow. coming, yep. You okay. get an 80 pound reminder. I gotta remember to that. To keep looking. From... That's right. <laughs> Technique is, um, well, it's better than uh, just standing there getting hit. Yeah. It's I'll right above elbows. that. Throw the elbows? Yeah, there you go. Look. All right, I feel like I'm not ready. I think I just got beaten. I believe so. <laughs> do, not, do not attack or defend against these bags. Simply run. OK. <laughs> Can you just tell me a bit about yourself and why you started this organization? I was teaching self-defense here in Detroit. I heard of a story of a woman being chased off a bridge in front of her daughter, right in broad daylight in front of a crowd of people. And I thought, if I had a student there, if one person I, I had trained had been there, right. they could stop this, that, that mother from being chased off that bridge and dying in front of her daughter. I was an airborne paratrooper when I got in the military. Mm -hmm. I've been studying martial arts my whole life. I was trained in firearms since age six. So for me, firearms, martial arts, the military, I was a private investigator when I got out of the military, so I had a chance to understand law. Mm -hmm. So I created an entire school around understanding how to deter, detect, and defend okay. yourself, your family, your community from violent criminals right. by understanding psychology, law, and skill in order to escape, control, and immobilize threat. Yes. And we emphasize nonviolence as, as, as a key because 
when you have violence and you use violence to solve violence, you're actually amplifying more violence. Right. The commander has set up a tactical training program open to all comers. Like a Detroit Robin Hood, he uses the profit they generate from patrolling wealthy neighborhoods to give free classes to low-income locals. I decided it was time I learned some basics. What was your, your title? I am Lieutenant Commander Morella Machinovich Brown. My code name is 111 Mantis, and I am the commander's wife and second in charge. Oh, OK. Yeah. What does VIPERS mean? Uh, violence Intervention Protective Emergency Response System. Okay. okay, and then we have volunteers, investigators, protectors, educators, rescuers, and searchers. So it has two meanings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys have code names? Yes. So for example, you see police officers, they have a nameplate that says Jace Kamansky. Okay. Okay, we don't have that right. for protection. We deal with a lot of violent criminals and a lot of not mentally stable individuals. So we don't want them knowing our family name. Right. So we have code names. My code name is 111 Mantis. Um, it corresponds with there was 110 people prior to me that right. successfully passed their testing requirements to earn their code name. Military has Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. Yep. You know, we have different ones. We have Alpha, Bravo, Cobra, Mantis, Delta, Jaguar, um, Razor. Yeah, I would like a code be name. a Razor, let's see. I'd be Razor? You'd be a Razor. One, one, you'd be a 116, Razor 116. Razor 116? Mm -hmm. Yep. Pretty cool. Officially, yeah. <laughs> it is kind of cool uh, to call yourself Razor 116. Once I acquired my official code name, I was ready to learn how to properly defend myself. So when we do the control grab, yeah. we would go here yeah. and then hold them right down here yeah. uh, until the police officers come to get them. Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, and there's different <laughs> techniques. So side headlock. I give you a side yep. headlock? Like that? So, yep, so basically what we do is we grab our air, yep. we come here, yep. you take your hand and generally you're gonna hook into the eye. Yeah. You're gonna peel back this way. Yeah. I mean, you can let go or you want okay. me to poke your eye. Um, and right. then this is what we do. We do the head inversion and we just hold here. And if they get out of control, we squeeze or lift up. Tapping. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you're going towards him. Yeah. I have several different ways to get right. you not to go that way. Temple spin is one. Then you also have the nose. Oh, those suck. Um, you have this. Yeah. Um, you have this, <laughs> and then obviously you have when you grab here. Yeah, the nose ones suck. Yep. They're really yeah. aggravating. Those. <laughs> you just basically want to hit right here. Yeah. Yeah, that hurts. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. easy. It's like 90-year-old woman can do this, sure, and it yeah. doesn't require strength. Commander Dale Brown and the Vipers don't just keep the streets of Detroit safe. They also patrol the waterways. The commander wanted to take me out on a boat. Show me why. You know why? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the boat looks like. I wonder if it's Miami Viced Out or Robocop boat. All right. Whoa. Yeah, the boat is just like the cars. It's so cool. Can you tell me about your boat? Yes, our boat is a tactical vessel designed for training. We use it to train our staff. Okay. We also use it to rescue people if they need help out on the water. We're growing the boat, so this time next year we should have a bigger one. Oh, yeah. Yep, our objective is to uh, double the size of the boat, and it'll be chrome instead of flat black. Really? <laughs> Terminator status. Yeah, we're reversing everything. So our <laughs> building's going to be chrome. Really? Our vehicles are going to be chrome. You're rebranding. Yeah, we're rebranding. Yeah. Just inverting. Yeah. I noticed your whole fleet is very uniform and well-branded. Thank is you. That, that's a, well, a conscious decision? Yes, everything. Yeah. The buildings, the vehicles, uh, the aircraft that are coming, all black and chrome. What kind of aircraft? Uh, we're going to get helicopters. Really? Yes, chrome. <laughs> It's like the coolest security company ever. Well, it's not, that's the thing that makes sure we separate. All blacked out vehicles have been seen by both smugglers as well as all the bad guys in all the movies yeah. and all the stealth aircraft in real life. Yeah. So we're going to switch that out with something that's never been seen, uh, which is all chrome vehicles. Makes sense. Go And therefore, we'll have uh, brand recognition worldwide. For sure. The commander has worldwide aspirations for his brand. 
but Detroit hasn't always been so supportive of African-American business owners. In your opinion, what's the real Detroit? The real Detroit is a story of racism and apartheidism that has been hidden from society outside of Detroit. The native Detroiters know about it. Eight Mile once uh, was not just a movie, but it was actually a wall that kept the African-Americans out. Oh, really? Uh, a physical wall. Then when African-Americans fought their way into living here in Detroit, they had to live in a place called Black Bottom, which is uh, the middle of Detroit. They were not allowed out. Basically, Detroit was a sundown town. And then when African-Americans were able to buy the land, the next thing that happened was the big businesses pulled out. Uh, and that's how our suburbs were created here in Detroit. White we, flight. Exactly. Whites decided to move out of Detroit. So European Americans took their business with them and refused to do uh, any type of business with African Americans. And so that's the story that they don't want to say in the media. They want to say that it's about, uh, you know, somehow business changed or the economy changed. The business is here. These car companies are thriving. So how could Detroit not be thriving? Right. And that's because they opened up car companies in areas where African Americans couldn't work. 20,000 European American men walked off the line when they found out the first African American was hired to work on the line. Their official statement was they would rather lose to Germany than to work next to a So when we understand that's the history, the 20,000 men would rather lose to Germany, to Hitler, than to work next to another American Christian. Then we understand those same men are still here. Their family members are still here. They're still a uh, part of the power structure, and they're making decisions for African Americans every day. And this is the story of Detroit that no one wants to tell. So that's part of our structure. Right. It's not a part of just an opinion. Yeah. So a lot of times, and even in foreign countries, America will try to say, well, you know, race is there, but it's just, you know, it's, it's just certain people. It's not, it's a system. It's governance. Governance, like an apartheid system that was unofficial, even though it was official. <laughs> entire neighborhood is burned down. I have no idea what it would be like to grow up here. You could live in a nice house that's in a decent neighborhood, I guess, but it would still be surrounded by burned down houses and dilapidated buildings. The people that live here, it's not their fault that this happened to the city. They had nothing to do with it. It had to do with industry leaving. And I'm pretty sure that the people that live here did not want that to happen. I think the original Model T factory is just right here. Henry Ford's first production line. I'm going to read this sign. Here at his Highland Park plant, Henry Ford in 1913 began the mass production of automobiles on a moving assembly line. Mass production soon moved from here to all phases of American industry and set the pattern of abundance for 20th century living. So this is the reason why everybody has too much stuff. This building is possibly where the American dream was birthed. And some might say that Detroit is where the American dream died. But I don't think it's that simple. I think that chapter of the American dream has moved on. And Detroit actually might be the beginning of it again because it's come full circle. It was this giant thriving city and then it died and now it's on the comeback. It seems like that first part of the American dream was about yourself. You know what I mean? Like your American dream. But it seems like now the, the new way to go is for people to come together and it's like our American dream for us. I think I see that happening here in Detroit. People getting together and saying, let's make this neighborhood better. And I think it's a good sign that, you know, Detroit's coming back because that means everywhere else could come back. I've seen a lot of depressing things <laughs> doing this show. And uh, 
honestly, whenever I leave a place, I leave feeling good because there's so many amazing people doing really cool stuff in, you know, like really hard conditions. It definitely shows the resilience of people. And if people want change to happen, they can make it happen. I mean, it's happening here. Cue the song. It may have been Camelot for Jack and Jacqueline, but on the Che Guevara Highway, filling up with gasoline. Fidel Castro's brother spies a rich lady who's crying over the luxury's disappointment, so he walks over and he's trying to sympathise with her. But he thinks that he should warn her that the third world is just around the corner. Mixing pop and politics, he asks me what the use is. I offer him embarrassment and my usual excuses While looking down the corridor Out to where the van is waiting I'm looking for the great leap forward Jungle sales are organised and pamphlets There's still parties to be hosted You can be active with the activists Or sleeping with the sleepers While you're waiting for the great leap forwards Oh, one leap forwards, two leaps back Will politics get me the sack? Waiting for the great leap forwards Well, here comes the future and you can't run for it If you've got a blacklist, I want to be on it Right, oh, it's a mighty long way down rock and roll from top of the box to draw in a down your white shit. The right leap over. If no one out there understands, just start your own revolution and cut out the middle man. The right leap over. Revolution!